This and That with Me and You is a podcast where we discuss some pretty dark and disturbing things. I talk about true crimes and cults and a lot of death. And I talk about the creepier stuff like paranormal, supernatural, and cryptids. Viewer discretion is advised while listening to us. Warning. All right, let's get into this. Episode 17, baby. 17, wow. Mm hmm. Okay, moving right along, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you got any updates for anybody this week? Um, I started my new job this week. Yeah. And I like it. You like it? Yeah, I like it. That's good. Yeah. Anything you can uh, tell anybody about your job? No, not really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Well, basically, I went from working in a group home for adults to working in a day hab for adults, which is like, it's like a, a facility where we support and promote independent living and occupy our residents' day-to-day -day time mm -hmm. with not having them sit on their butts at home on the couch watching TV all day or scrolling through the internet or playing video games or whatever okay. they would like to do. It's just, I mean, they like coming to the day hab for sure. That's good. I but mean, yeah, some of them. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we teach classes and um, we have daily activities and we throw parties and we just do fun stuff all day, really. And... I am in charge of making sure all of that happens smoothly. I have to make calendars for activities and outings and a class schedule and yeah. Okay. That's what I do. Well, I'd like it's... to be on their side. <laughs> the ordeal there, not yours. Yeah. Jeez. Um on top of also because I'm not like actually a manager, I'm just like a step above what I was before mm -hmm. so I have to do what I was doing before but with 30 people instead of four people gotcha and um, I mean but I don't like have to cook them dinner and shower them like we have to feed them lunch and like teach classes you know so it is different yeah you know and like help them in the bathroom if they need it and right those things um but um and, uh, and then I have to do those scheduling things on top of that. Okay. So, yeah. All right. That's what I got. What do you, you got anything exciting? Well, um, I mean, I did start working on the basement, uh, trying to yeah. strip the walls. That, Ugh. that is a pain in the butt. Yeah. Because... It's going to be extremely time-consuming because we're trying not to have to pay a professional to do all this. Um, and we only have so much time. Yeah. In a day. Yep. Um, I also, uh, because we've been apparently having issues with the truck, the pickup again, um, I bought a new starter. And, of course, the freaking thing it's doing where it just doesn't want to start hasn't happened since I bought the damn starter. So... Putting off having to change it by myself until I need to. <laughs> so, my luck, it'll be freaking tomorrow. Yeah. Um, hmm, let's see if there's anything. Oh, here's a here's a cute one for everybody that's been keeping up with the kids' side of the, the of updates. Of our lives. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Annie and Eli both love Paw Patrol. Yeah. Annie doesn't really love watching Paw Patrol. No, she just likes the characters. Like, she, yeah. she's she got a thing for Sky, which is the girl, one of two girls on the whole series. Um, but Eli has shown extreme interest in Rubble. The, ye the, the yellow little, one. The one that wears yellow and he's a little bulldog? He's a, no, he's a Boston Terrier, mm. according to google <laughs> but um or maybe he's a boston i don't know he's a boston something okay. but anyway um i wound up buying him like a, a stuffed animal version of that because they fight over the Everything sky Paw patrol yeah well that too but yeah. 
but Annie's got her stuff Sky that she carries around and plays with and stuff and it pisses Eli off because he can't play with it while she's playing with it so I got him a rubble and he and loves that thing he and won't carries put it, it down yes. <laughs> oh my god he got so mad at me tonight because I told him we couldn't put it in the bathtub with him <laughs> oh my good grief kid yeah <laughs> but uh let's see other than that um let's Annie see. starts pre-k oh yeah Tuesday. yeah she does yeah. um it, Tuesday of our recording this not Tuesday of airing this but yeah. yes um yeah she's she seems ex excited about it she's uh picked out an not outfit super happy about like well, I mean, she hasn't said anything about it since, but when I told her she was going to a new school, she was kind of upset about not seeing everybody in her, that it was in her class b before. Yeah. And new teachers, like, she was nervous. But, like, I kind of, like, tried to hype it up. Like, you're going to meet new people and make new friends. Well, and... I mean, to be fair, she is going to be in school with several people she does know, like our neighbor, for example. Yeah. One of, one of the children next door, it is, is the same in her class, yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess there's going to be another girl and a boy that was in her classes from from early Head Start that'll mm -hmm. be in her class this year, too. So. Yeah. So, I mean, she'll have some... Some similar faces. Yes. Familiar faces. Familiar faces. Yes. There you go. Yeah, she'll have... She'll have that, and it should And it one of her teachers that was in her class last year is going to her class this year. So... Okay. Yeah. Um, and sorry, guys, if I talk kind of weird or have like a, I don't know, it seems like a speech impediment this week because I have a pretty serious ear infection and it's messing with how I hear myself talk. <laughs> and you should just go to the doctor and get some medicine, but you don't listen. So They're going to give me the same shit that I bought, which is eardrops. It's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm using the eardrops. It started to clear up. So I'm good. Okay. Anyway, oh, um, on the work-related side of it, you talked about your new job. My job put me on a super short week, and it's really going to screw with us this month for sure. For money, yeah. Yeah, because I left out, what, Tuesday, Tuesday night? Yeah, and, then, and came home Thursday night. Yeah, yeah, came home Thursday night. So, yeah, that's that's a horribly short week for a truck driver. Yeah. So... And this week's not starting off too much better. Okay, Lily's on a hopping trip right now. Right next <laughs> to us. Because <laughs> uh, I won't be leaving until Tuesday morning this week. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's our updates. Yeah. You got anything specific to talk about uh, your warnings or whatever? No. No? Okay. Uh Warning explicit content. Like, we already covered it. Yeah. I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't have anything specific on mine either. So. Okay. So what uh, what story you got for us this week? What is the most viral subject on the entirety of the internet? Um, the most popular videos on TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, all of it. Depends on, depends on the day. <laughs> if you're racking your brain... The answer is animals. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. More specifically, mostly cats. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> to start off this story, we have to talk about some people that are seemingly unrelated. Okay. Um, Deanna Thompson. She's a data analyst for a casino in Las Vegas. Fine. Um, she describes herself as being a textbook computer nerd, and she is a pet owner who loves animals. Okay. Um, Deanna goes as goes by Body Moving Online, and she describes it as her internet persona. When she is Body Moving Online, she has the freedom to be whoever she wants to be and protect her identity. So, sometime in 2010, Deanna was scrolling through Facebook, as one does. Yeah. And she sees a post about a YouTube video that is being shared a lot. Okay. Um, and people are pretty upset about it. So she like, she's like, what's all the fuss about? Right. So she clicks the link and she's taken to a video on YouTube called, called One Boy, Two Kittens. Hmm. 
in the video. So this is Christmas by John Lennon is playing in the background. And there's just a beige wall and a bed in the foreground. Gotcha. On the bed is a fuzzy wolf blanket, kind of like the one you have. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. It's just one wolf's face on it, though. Gotcha. And there are two kittens on the bed. And you see a hand come into frame, and it's petting the kittens. And then a guy comes into the frame in a teal hoodie, and it's over his head. It's covering most of his face. But you can see, like, black fringy bangs over the forehead. Okay. Um, He then puts the kittens into a vacuum seal bag. Oh, what? He's attaching the hose to the bag where, where you would. And one of the kittens tries to, like, playfully run out of the bag. And he forces it back into the bag and... Well, I'm sorry to tell anyone this. He suffocates the kitten kittens by sealing the bag. All right, I don't, I don't really like cats, but that's wrong. Yeah. Yes, I have not seen the videos, and I will never watch the videos. I, I cannot watch an animal be being hurt at all. So. All right. And I love cats, even though you're you're being very annoying right now. <laughs> yeah. She's right next to me. She's like, I want to know about it. See, the thing is, Lily decides every time these t- microphones turn on that mm-hmm. she's going to make that thing jingle around her neck as loud as she can. Yes. So Deanna is obviously horrified and she goes to the comment section and she sees people, of course, outraged and pissed. Right. Saying all kinds of things like who does this person think he is doing this and posting it to the Internet? How could you? This person deserves to die. They deserve to go to jail. The comment section is just blowing up. Right. Um, Deanna keeps scrolling and she finds someone has posted a link to a Facebook Facebook group called Find the Kitten Vacuumer for Great Justice. Oh. Um, the profile fast. picture was an adorable kitten looking mischievous, like he's plotting with his little hand, his little paws together. Oh boy. <laughs> anyway. So Deanna is scrolling through the group. She sees a lot of people just being very emotional about the video, but she finds one guy who's just sticking to the straight facts. Mm -hmm. John Green from Los Angeles. So together in the Facebook group, they just start analyzing everything in the video. Oh, okay. Okay. Super sleuths. (laughs) (laughs) Everything about the room they can think of. You know, they're just... Right. Start looking at it. So the video was posted on December 24th, 2000, 2010 on YouTube by You Only Wish 500. He also made a comment that said, all haters can suck my huge dick, LOL, in the comment section. Can you say small dick energy? <laughs> so when John clicked on the profile, he noticed they had also liked a video for the movie Catch Me If You Can. Okay. For those of you that do not know, Leonardo DiCaprio plays a real criminal con man who impersonated a doctor and a pilot and wrote a lot of counterfeit checks. Right, which is based on a true story. (laughs) And basically, an FBI agent chases him around the world and takes years to catch him. Tom Hanks. Yes. The con man was so good, he ended up working for the FBI identifying counterfeit checks. Right. The true story. So one could believe this person was leaving kind of a, a breadcrumb uh-huh. um, to see if you could find me. You know, message there. Come, come get me, you know. Catch me if you can, yes. literally. So the group at the time is really focusing on identifying the short side profile of the person you get in the video. And okay. Deanna is like, this seems dumb. I feel as though identifying a person would be a lot harder than identifying objects in the room. Yeah. And where they could have come from. Right. Somebody's watched too much CSI. (laughs) So this Facebook group basically starts picking apart everything in that room. The wall sockets, the light fixtures, the bed, the blanket on the bed. They're... I will point out, wall sockets, super important. Because that tells you what country you're in. Yes. And they're basically reverse Google image searching before... It was that easy to do it like you do on your phone now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It used to be kind of hard. <laughs> they even found the manufacturer of the wolf blanket. <laughs> oh, gosh. They went on Microsoft Paint, basically, from what it looks like, and made a layout of the room. 
Then they start to analyze the audio. They can tell there are voices in the background. People are laughing and there's a lot of noise. And then yeah. you hear a click and the noise stops. Uh. So a member of the Facebook group named Nicey Punk from the Ukraine who identified it as Russian. Hmm. Okay. They figure out it's an old Russian game show. They actually found the exact episode. So they spent weeks trying to tie anything into the video to Russia and nothing. It's a dead end. Gotcha. So Deanna and, and John are determined they will be finding this guy and they will stop at nothing to do so. Right. And all of a sudden another video appears on YouTube with John Lennon's Imagine playing in the background. What is his obsession with John Lennon? I don't know. Maybe because he was killed, murdered. Mm -hmm. It kind of hurts. It kind of freaking offends me. I'm just saying. Killing animals. My listen to John Lennon, one of my heroes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, he is playing with the kittens that he killed. Right. <laughs> Their corpses on the bed. Oh. God. And he's posted some pictures of the kittens in his freezer along with it. That's gross. He also posted a link from a fake Facebook account called John Smith with a sunset on the beach as the profile picture on the Facebook group. Wow. Yeah. So he Ballsy. found the Facebook group. Um, the link takes you to pictures of him holding the cats with his face blurred out. Super ballsy. Yes. So this video shows more objects in the room. So they take all of the video frames and make them images. Okay. Um, the video is moving so fast around the room, you can't really see details. But if you look at it at each individual frame, you can see so many more details of the room itself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they are analyzing tens of thousands of frames. And all of a sudden, they see a pack of cigarettes in the room. Mm. Um, so for my non-smokers out there, if you did not know, with the exception of the U.S. and our iconic cigarette brands, you can get all over the country, like Newport, Camel, or Marlboro. Cigarettes are different everywhere else you go in the world. Yeah, if you go over to like Thailand or the Philippines, there you could get marbles, sure, but they have distinctive outer casings to them. So it's kind of blurry, as you know, even frozen frame, it's you yeah. can't see everything perfectly. Plus, it's 2012. So, yeah. <laughs> so what they did figure out though is the cigarettes have the surgical surgeon general warning on them. That's American. Yeah. So obviously they are most likely from the United States. Yep. Yes. Because it's the only place that does that. Mm. Then they see a yellow vacuum and it's kind of a distinct looking vacuum. Um, so something we all know about the internet is that there are forms for everything oh, in the yeah. world. And Deanna finds a vacuum cleaner form of where people essentially help you find parts or fix your vacuum on. Okay. Okay. So she posts to the forum, does anyone recognize this vacuum with the freeze frame of it? Right. Yeah. They identify it immediately as the Kenmore canister cleaner, the Asp Aspiradora model, 72126082. Goddamn. Also, that's <laughs> only sold in North America. Oh, yeah. <laughs> These people are good, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's some super sleuth right, <laughs> right there. So they knew they could start looking in Mexico, the U.S., and Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and then, just as they're finding this stuff out, Rescue Inc. gets wind of the bastard killing kittens. So Rescue Inc. is basically like a biker gang that... Um, had a reality TV show on Nat Geo for a very, like, one season, like, six episodes. Um, but they're a biker gang that does everything necessary within the means of the law to rescue animals from bad so situations with an in-your-face approach. Okay. okay. Is how they describe it, personally. Okay? Cool. Immediately, they conclude that this person is doing this for attention, and they are displaying the telltale signs of someone that will become a serial killer. Ooh, okay, Rescue yeah. Inc. is saying that. So Rescue Inc. is pretty popular and has a pretty big following on social media because they're animal activists. And well, yeah. obviously, they have a unique way of going about it. Yeah. Okay. So they post a $5,000 reward to capture this person cool on facebook which on one hand is good to get media attention but on the other hand people went nuts with this 
um, you know, like this $5,000 reward. So an explosion of people join the group to help in the investigation and they have tidal waves of leads coming in. Yeah. It's absolute chaos. People are saying he's from all over the world and they've already pretty much concluded he's most likely in North America. Right. Okay. So it's not really helping them. So one day this guy with the username jams, he crams a lot in his ass. Hmm. Like, you know, one of those stupid joke names yeah like amanda hug and kiss or see more butts yes and um the picture uh, on the profile is like a heavily edited photo of a man his body is facing forward but like looking off to the side mm. and um in all black with a sam hat on okay and he looks like he could be the guy from the videos similar hairstyle and color well he posts a video of a kitten being burned alive in a cage on his Facebook page with the title on the top, LOL, too much. Uh, yeah. he, he, okay. So the Rescue Inc. guy, he's like, this guy is craving attention. What would happen if I just flat out posted on his Facebook if he was the guy that, that did the one boy, two kittens video? So he does. And he went back and forth with him for a bit, and he eventually said, yes, I did it. I killed the kitten. I kill kittens for fun. So they start looking at his friends on his Facebook page to try and find him. Yeah. And so they link him to some guy in Africa based off of his friends they found. Some guy tagged in a photo named Jamzy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Deanna and John are not convinced because already we've like established that most likely this person lives in North America. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so they reverse image search the GMZ crams a lot in his ass profile picture. Okay. Okay. On a website, like before you could like just take a picture on your phone or a screenshot. Okay. And they, they are able to see on this website where else the picture has been posted. Right. And they find one result on a male pornography website. And they mm -hmm. find the image without the Santa hat under the name Timmy on this site. Okay. Um, so the other Facebook group members start lynching this other guy's Facebook that they have automatically assumed is this Jamzy crams a lot in his ass guy. Mm -hmm. They're lynching him like on Facebook. Okay. Gotcha. And, um, they're just coming for him. So they discover the identity of this person and his name is Edward Jordan. And shortly after this occurred, he killed himself. Wow. Yes. And it turns out that he was just an internet troll trying to be a copycat when he posted that video. That's a dumb thing to do. Yeah. And um, so she, he be kind of became an in, a victim of internet bullying. I mean, it's never like really been proven that that's why he killed himself, but right, it's it is still kind of sad. So, and it's kind of sad that like they like associated him with this fake Facebook and like publicly lynched him. Yeah, you know. Then some of the group members start receiving private messages from another fake. Facebook account called Beverly Kent with another basic sunset photo. Okay. The message said the person you are looking for is named Luca Magnata. Oh. And they're like, who the fuck is Luca Magnata? Sounds like a fake porn name. Kind of. So they Google Luca Magnata and there are just hundreds of hits of this guy posting pictures of himself all over the internet him posing and traveling all over the world. Oh boy. Like this guy looks like he's living like this billionaire, like rich man, like lavish lifestyle. Right. And he's got tons of fan sites of people just adoring him and his good looks. Okay. Okay. And YouTube slideshow videos of pictures of him posing in model like photos, just so many hits that you think this guy would be a legitimate celebrity. Right. Um, if you just Googled his name. Stories he's dating Madonna. Mm. Also, but no one has ever heard of this guy. Right. But the side profile of his face matches the, the videos. Oh. Okay. 
So due to the Facebook group's interest or history of false accusations and what happened there, mm -hmm. John and Deanna were hesitant to share this information. So they create a private group called Luca Intel with a few people from the original group, people they trusted to actually investigate further. Yeah. Okay. So they eventually, eventually find an audition tape for a reality show about male models called Cover Guy. So they can hear his voice finally, and they can tell his voice definitely sounds like he's from North America. Okay. Okay. They also figure out this show is from Canada. Oh. So they start noticing a pattern in the photos. Like they start digging deeper into like all of these um, photos all over the internet of him traveling all over the world. Mm -hmm. And they notice that the skin tone of the face doesn't quite match the skin tone of the body in a lot of them and almost Photoshop. all of them and almost all of the photos like it's not just that like just something looks off like you can see lines where things don't mat match up bad pixelation on the neck in a lot of the photos things like that that's the early ages of <laughs> photoshop right there that's what that so is so luca magnata has put his face on all these photos to make it seem like he was living this ideal travel the world lavish lifestyle but mm -hmm. then you start to look at the fan groups and all the comments on these groups they're all different accounts but they all say the same things like luca is so hot sexy boy little prince same verbiage same phrasing same style of writing on every comment so he wrote he made an ass load of accounts to hype himself up on the internet yeah Okay. So then they find this article in the Toronto Sun, a tabloid like magazine by and the article is by a guy named Joe Warmington. So in 2007, Joe Warmington is listening to a radio show and this guy is frantically calling and upset saying people will not stop associating him with Carla Homolka. Which if you've been listening to all of our episodes in order, you know exactly who that is right also if you're from canada pretty much everyone know who, who she is there she is the most hated person in all of canada yeah <laughs> besides her ex-husband paul bernardo right so finally he he says my name is luca magnata on the radio show so joe reaches out to him through email and eventually gets a call from luca himself and so they decide to meet up at the sun newsroom Okay. Um, Joe was baffled, baffled to find that Luca looks uncannily like Paul Bernardo. At the time, he had bleach blonde hair. So, yeah, the similarities were there. Um, but Luca's also had um, plastic surgery on his face. Ah. He has a video footage of him interviewing Luca. And he's like, this rumor has destroyed my life, basically. And I want to set the record straight that her and I have no connection. He's just adamant that these rumors are all over the place and that he can't get a job modeling or acting because he's being associated with Carla Homolka, even though there's no like basis to this mm. at all. Okay. <laughs> Attention seeking. So now this is all adding up to Deanna that he made fake accounts to make it look like he was dating Homolka to refute it in return for fame. Wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Remember the numero uno rule in, of the internet is don't fuck with cats. <laughs> That's not the, well, maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> well, obviously, babe, you and I talk about this all the time. Mm -hmm. Any attention is still attention, even negative attention. Right. <laughs> Posting that video of him killing cats got him lots of attention. It went pretty viral. Uh-huh. For uh, context to our listeners, Cassie's trying a newer age method of, of parenting, and she keeps informing me that when Annie is a, or Eli are seeking attention, even if it's getting in trouble, me providing that is still providing attention. So... That's what she was saying. Yes, when she's specifically doing attention-seeking behavior, trying to press your buttons. But anyway. <laughs> the problem is this interview was three years prior to the cat-killing video, so they still do not know where he is. Hmm. He possibly is in Canada, but they can't definitively prove that to the police. Right. Okay. 
So they start combing through every single photo he's ever posted on the internet, knowing that they could find something that he messed up on. Right. They're looking at the data on each photo, you know, that EXIF data on the, Im in the images. Yep, that's where you pull up the properties and you find out what day it was taken, what time it was taken, and what location it was yes, taken. Yes, you can pull exactly that. So they're uploading every single picture he has ever posted to the internet onto a site that can show you the EXIF data. Mm -hmm. And finally, they get a hit of GPS coordinates. There you go. A photo of Luca setting on a very beautiful vintage looking chase lounge chair in front of a designer store looks like he could be in a mall somewhere okay so the site will pinpoint the gps coordinates on a map for you and it takes them to the toronto eating eaton shopping center oh okay toronto canada and the date was october 25th 2010. okay the kitten killer video happened in november so they are pretty certain he is in canada yeah yeah so john is like i'm going to find out his address like I'm not letting this go. So he finds a photo of Luca on a balcony of an apartment complex from what it looks like. And it's winter outside with snow on the ground. And you zoom in the background of the photo, you can see the street nearby. And you can see a gas station called Petro Canada. So he starts cross-referencing things that he remembers about Luca. Hmm. He remembers this post where Luca says the paparazzi are following him outside of his apartment in Etobicoke, Canada which is a suburb outside of Toronto. Right. So he goes on Google Maps, locates all the Petro Canada gas stations in Etobicoke, Canada, of which at the time there were only six. Gotcha. So he goes to the street view on maps near each gas station, and he's looking for this building in that photo. Mm -hmm. He finds the apartment building, 304 Mill Street, Etobicoke, Canada. You know, I've sent you a couple TikToks of this guy that does that on TikTok to prove how dangerous your even short videos can be you people can track you by the smallest thing in your videos it's yeah scary it's scary <laughs> so um so they decided to go to the toronto police department it took them a while to get them to believe them and they the, but the toronto police department did finally go to the apartment and knocked on the door a person answered and they say yes a person named luca Manana, magnata had lived there but he had since moved to russia Okay. The group started to lose its oomph on this, so they really couldn't find more leads because months had gone by. Nothing new was posted. The case was going stale, and they were on the edge of this not being solved. Right. Then a video uploaded to YouTube titled Bath Time, LOL. Oh, no. Break the Chain by Lupe Fiasco is playing in the background. You see a bathtub filling up with water. You see a man messing with a broomstick, but you can only see like the back of his head. Mm -hmm. Then you see he has a cat duct taped to a broom handle. Oh no. And you see the poor cat's face looking desperate to live. <laughs> then mm. you see the cat being held underwater via broomstick. Oh God. Until the life leaves his body. That's not okay. Then later that day, another video was uploaded to YouTube. You see the same room with the bed, different bedspread this time. You hear the little drummer boy playing in the background. You see a man crouching over the bed in like a red sweater and a Santa hat. Okay. He's holding a cat down in his hands. He's letting the cat play with the ball on the Santa hat. He leaves the hat on the bed and the cat is playing with it. And then you realize there's a giant python snake under the pillow on the bed. Oh, hell no. So the python does what a python does, and it eats the cat. Oh, God. Yeah. That cat actually looked a lot like Medusa. So the group comes alive again. Yeah. <laughs> and they are analyzing everything in the video. The first thing you notice is the username of the account that posted the video, Leslie Ann Downey. We have not talked about this, but it is something I desire to talk about in the future. Okay. Leslie Ann Downey was a victim of Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, the perpetrators of what is often referred to as the Moore's murders. Okay. A couple that killed and molested five children in and around Manchester, England. Oh. And this is the second time that Luca has shown interest in serial killers. Yeah. So, so very much a red flag of him escalating to hurting people in the future. Right. 
So these videos caught more media attention. The Sun in English pub England published an article about it. A British journalist from the Sun named Alex West got, gets a message from another fake account. It says the person you are looking for is currently in London, England, and his name is Luca Magnata. And he's okay. staying at the Fusilier, Fusilier Inn. So Alex decided to go there and look for him. Right. But Alex is secretly recording. Oh, this could be interesting. And he confronts Luca, who claims he's photoshopped into the videos and being framed. Hmm. And Back in 2012? Yes. I don't he, know about that. <laughs> he says many people have a vendetta against him, but he will not say what for. Okay. And soon after this conversation, Alex West receives an email from John Kilbride another victim of the Moore murders. Mm. It's very, very taunting. Like he says, it's frustrating not being able to name the person doing this or find them or catch them. Basically, basically like, yeah, try and catch me if you can. Right. See if you can prove it was me. Yeah. So he also says, next time you see me, it will be in another movie. This time with humans in it, not just pussies. Well, that's literally a vow to become a killer. And Scotland Yard could not help because they did not have lawful precedent. So I guess that makes sense. Then another fake account, Joe Smith, another generic sunset post um, picture, posts a message to the group. The me on the group. Yeah. The message says body move in 99, all caps. That's it. So that's Deanna. That's ominous. Then another group member found a video that this fake account liked. The same fake account. Yeah. It was a video posted on YouTube, a sort of body cam video of the casino Deanna works at. Oh, shit. Like a POV of someone walking around the casino. Oh, gosh. That's fucking scary. Yeah. Then John gets a Facebook message saying, hey, here's this video I just came across. It looks like that guy Luca you've been looking for, isn't it? So... Makes me wonder if Luca's the one sending the fucking, hey, check this out. Yes. He goes to the video, and there it is, what they've all been worried about. On May 25th, 2012, the video was called One Lunatic, One Ice Pick, posted oh, no. to bestgore.com. I hate to say it, but I think I've seen this. Bestgore.com actually is a uh, gore.com is a um like a youtube kind of website from mm -hmm. canada that but posts like violent videos yes. uh three guys one hammer or yeah three guys one hammer um the bme pain olympics those are all on that website it's so He's really capitalizing on the two girls, one cup viral video title configuration. I guess a lot of people were then. Uh, yeah. But anyway, you see a bedroom again, a guy tied up on the bed, like tied up to the bed frame, music playing in the background. Then the sub suspect sort of checks on him, like is rubbing his head or something. Okay. And then the suspect picks up the camera and you see the man's tied up's face. Mm -hmm. Then it cuts to a different angle. So the suspect comes up to the bed carrying something in his hand, an ice pick looking item, and he just starts stabbing repeatedly over and over and over. And then it cuts to him like he dismembered the body, followed by acts of necrophilia. Oh, God. And then the nope, perpetrator then uses a knife and a fork to cut out off some of the flesh and gets a puppy to chew on the body Ugh. a little black and white puppy and then he plays with the severed head in the bathtub and stabs the puppy to death in the bathtub what the fuck so the internet loose do what they do again and they start to analyze the video obviously right. a really hard one to do yeah if the other ones weren't hard they discover the song is called truth faith by New World or New Order playing. And Luca had used that song before in some of his picture montages that he had posted on YouTube. Okay. Um, they notice a Casablanca movie poster on the wall in the background of the video as well. 
So the problem they are running into is they cannot prove where the video is coming from definitively. Right. They know where the first kitten killing video was taken. They, however, cannot also cannot get Canada law enforcement involved. On May 26, 2012, an attorney from Montana attempted to report the video to Toronto police, mm -hmm. his local sheriff, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation, but the report was dismissed by officials. So people are trying to contact law enforcement about this video, these right. videos, and they're being ignored because yeah. it's kind of hard to figure out where the videos are coming from. Unless you got a team of super sleuths. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the group also contacts law enforcement and they such they just sit back and wait for the body to be found so the investigation could start and they can turn over evidence. Right. You know, on May 29th, 2012, a janitor discovered a decomposing torso inside a suitcase left in a garbage pile in the alley behind an apartment building in the Snowden area of Montreal. Oh gosh. He first saw the suitcase on May 25th. Like, so literally a day after the murder happened or the day of the murder but it mm -hmm. was not picked up due to the large amount of garbage that day okay footage from the surveillance cameras inside the building showed a suspect bringing numerous garbage bags outside like it shows him taking probably 20 trips with Damn. small items each time it's really fucking weird meanwhile the group of the group was analyzing every piece of content Luca has ever put out on the internet again. Yeah. Deanna discovers a new video she hasn't seen before. Another photo slideshow video. This one has a photo Deanna and John haven't seen before in it. Okay. Luca is in all blue. He's leaning on some concrete block stairs. You can see a traffic light and a building in the background. You can see the foliage on the trees looks like spring so it's recent gotcha the pedestrian crosswalk lights is what they can see that really stand out stands out to them it's black and square which is kind of unique yeah um i believe the ones here in the states are usually yellow and the ones in toronto are usually yellow for sure mm -hmm. so he's probably not in toronto anymore right so they find that the pedestrian lights in montreal are black and square Okay. So they again go on Google Maps Street View and are going block by block through the streets of Montreal trying to find where this photo was taken. Yeah, yeah, okay. The McGill University in downtown Montreal. Oh, they found it. Oh, yes. shit. Okay. <laughs> so they pace, placed him in Montreal recently. Right. So they go to the Montreal police trying to establish credibility with them. Nothing. <laughs> At of course not. Yes. But at 11 a.m. on May 29, 2012, a pat package containing a left foot was delivered to the national headquarters of the Conservative Party of Canada in Ottawa. The package was stained with blood, had a foul smell, and was marked with a red heart symbol, and the foot was wrapped in pink tissue paper. Hmm. Happy <laughs> Valentine's Day. <laughs> foot fetish? In May. <laughs> Sorry. A note was found with the package sent to the Conservative Party saying roses are red, violets are blue. The p police will need dental files to identify you, bitch. Oh, shit. It also said six body parts had been distributed and the perpetrator would kill again. Oh, God. On May 30th, 2012, it was confirmed that the body parts belonged to the same individual. So the torso and the foot belonged to the same individual. Okay. They found a torso in a suitcase. Right. So the following day. So they're connecting yeah. one body. Uh huh. But the Montreal, pol so the Montreal police are finding a ton of stuff in the garbage that was near the suitcase, blood stained items, receipts with Luca's name on it, Dumbass. Luca's Toronto driver's license, Dumbass. a dead black and white puppy. Oh, I know a letter with Luca's name and address. Dumbass. The Casablanca poster. Dumbass. A screwdriver that had been spray painted a metallic silver color to make it look like an ice pick. Interesting. Yes. And a knife knife with pieces of skin and blood on it. Ew. Also, more body parts. The legs and arms without hands and feet. Oh god. And no head, but they and they still haven't found the head. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so they know where the crime scene is now because they 
fucking Luca's address was in there. It's in that building. They yeah. fe- they figured out what apartment number it is. <laughs> well, at least they have a good idea. Right. Mm-hmm. The apartment that the letter is addressed to, anyway. At this time, the police are thinking Luca is possibly the victim, though, because what suspect leaves behind their own driver's license close to all the evidence from the murder you committed? A moron. <laughs> The day they found the suitcase, police searched the apartment Luca was renting on DeCary Boulevard. He had moved in four months prior, and his rent was paid up to June 1st. Um, The apartment had been mostly emptied before he left. Blood was found in different items, including the mattress, the refrigerator, the table, and the bathtub. Damn. So inside the closet, they found written in red ink. If you don't like the reflection, don't look in the mirror. I don't care. Hmm. I feel like I've heard that somewhere before. So at this point, Deanna starts blaming herself, feeling like she egged him on by giving him attention on social media. You know, negative attention is still attention. So she leaves the group and is done with it because she's just feeling super guilt over this. Right. But the police... Hey, you know, the package, that package had a barcode on it. Oh, God. Okay. And the police were able to identify the post office they were sent from. So they go to the post office and Cote Denejes, Denejes, I don't know. Uh, It's got like the little like lines over the O and stuff. I can't say. So they go to the post office and review the camera footage and they find the footage matches the image of the person who brought all the trash down so Mm. the person who has dropped off these packages that were pretty much sent to the prime minister of quebec right um (laughs) which is just crazy yeah so they match to the pictures of the person bringing the dead body trash down and all that so Hmm. The documentation that came along with the sending out of the package was it signed by an individual named Rocco. Okay. And Luca's name is Luca Luca Rocco Magnana. Ah. (laughs) He also informed the police that there were two packages, not one. Right. The postman. So shortly after this occurred, another package containing a left hand was intercepted in a Canada Canada post processing facility addressed to the liberal party. And it was packaged in the same manner. Oh gosh. So at this point they believe Luca to be the suspect. They, they kind of like have an idea, Mm -hmm. but they cannot release it to the public yet without proof. Right. Luca Rocco Magnata. I was going to go into a little history on him that wasn't included in the documentary. Um, So he was born Eric Clinton Kirk Newman on July 24th, 1982 in Scarborough, Ontario. So he's from the same place as the Scarborough rapist. Yeah. (laughs) The son of Anna Yorkin and Donald Newman. He was the first of three. And according to him, his mother was obsessed with cleanliness. He would and would routinely lock her children out of the house. And wow. once put her children's pet rabbits out in the cold to freeze to death. Jeez. His father was diagnosed with schizophrenia in 1994, after which he divorced her, his mother and leading Luca to move in with his grandmother, Phyllis. Okay. Um, then Luca was later on diagnosed with schizophrenia, and he received a disability allowance, which mm. he supplemented um, with being a escort. Oh, and not bes- illegal in Canada. <laughs> yes. Besides his work at a, as an escort, he began to appear. He began in two thousand three to appear in gay pornographic movies, well. and he also worked as a stripper. And he appeared as a pinup model in 2005 issue Toronto's Fab magazine using the pseudonym Jimmy. Hmm. Although some media labeled him as a porn star, further reporting showed that his work as a porn actor had been anything but prolific or high profile as he had shot less than a dozen videos over a five year period. Um, 
I don't know enough about the porn he, industry to tell you if that's a lot or not. He also did not have much, much success modeling either. He legally changed his name from Eric Clinton Kirk Newman to Luca Rocco Magnata on August 12, 2006. And he declared bankruptcy in March of 2007, owing $17,000 in various debts. Damn. Um, in 2007, he was unsuccessfully competitor on an out TV reality series um, for Cover Guy, the interview that I talked about before. Right. Um, he had multiple cosmetic surgeries, which I had mentioned before, mm -hmm. and audi auditioned for the Slice Network television so show, Plastic Makes Perfect, hmm. in February 2008. Okay. Um, but I don't think he made into it. Hmm. Um, in 2005, he was going by his birth name at this time. He was convicted of one count of impersonation and three counts of fraud against Sears Canada, The Brick, and 2001 Audio Video. Yeah, you he got me on that yeah, one. I don't yeah. know. He had taken advantage of a mentally disabled young woman by convincing her to apply for credit cards and then using those cards himself to purchase over $10,000 worth of goods. Ah. He was also accused of sexually assaulting the woman, although that charge was later dropped. He pleaded guilty and received a nine-month conditional sentence with 12 months of probation. The court noted at that time that he had significant psychiatric issues and did not always take his medication. Uh-huh. So now the police are officially looking for Luca. At this time, they do not have a clue about who the victim is. And the police receive an email about the videos of the cats and the murder going viral on the internet. And so the police are finally clued into the videos. Okay. So they see the Casablanca poster in the video and all the things are adding up because they did find that poster in the trash also. Right. Um, the police are just baffled by all of this. In the video, they get to see the victim's face. For the first time, they have some identifying markers for this victim. You can clearly see that it's a Asian man in his late 20s. Um, at that point, they had thought it was a white man. Okay. Um, up until that point. Then they find the video footage of John Lin and Luca going into the apartment building. So John Lin, also known as Justin Lin, was born on December 30th, 1978 and came from Wuhan, China. He had come to Canada in 2010 with the intention of starting a new life there and to study computer engineering. Okay. In 2012, he was registered as an international student and an undergraduate in the engineering and computer science faculty at the Concordia University in Montreal. Hmm, smarty pants. Yes, Lynn had been studying in Montreal since July 2011, previously attending the Thai Art College, a language school, and had worked part-time as a convenience store clerk in Point St. Charles. Okay. And he moved into Griffin Town area apartment with a roommate on May 1st of 2012. Uh-huh. John Lynn, who was gay, had at some point been married to a woman, though they later divorced. In Canada, he lived for a time with another Chinese man. Um, he had never revealed his sexual orientation to his family in China, even though they had met his boyfriend um, hmm. shortly before his murder. Lynn's relationship with his partner had ended because Lynn was experiencing pressure from his family to settle down and marry a woman. Right. So after breaking up with his boyfriend, Lynn had been using Grindr and other web applications to meet with men. Okay. And John Lynn was last seen on May 20, 2012, and his friends reported getting a text message from his phone at 9 p.m. His boss became suspicious when he did not show up for his shift the next day. Three of his friends went into his apartment on May 27th. He was, and they found his poor cat was like starving. Oh no. Yeah. And like he loved his cat and it was his baby. So obviously they knew something was wrong. So he was reported missing to police on May 29th, 2012. The same exact day his body was found. Wow. Yeah. So the last image 
Image showing John Lynn alive were taken by a surveillance camera on the night of May 24, 2012. They showed John Lynn and Luca Magnata entering the apartment where Luca lived that I talked about just a minute ago. <laughs> right. So I did. Deanna accidentally scrolls through TV and stumbles upon them identifying the victim. And she decides she needs to get back in justice for John Lynn, you know? Right. So Deanna starts thinking about the pump puppy. Okay. And how millions of people all over the world get free pets on Craigslist. Okay. So she starts scrolling through Craigslist one post at a time, looking for anything that would look like it was Luca. Gotcha. And the group found a posting four days before the murder, looking for a dog in Montreal. Hi, I have a limited space apartment. I am looking for a dog. I am very experienced with dogs. My family owned a pet store. Okay. Deanna remembers a fake account the group was tracking, Vladimir Romanoff. Mm -hmm. He had made a post on a website about a year ago, and in the post it said my family owned a pet store. Okay. So the writing style also matched Luca. So now Deanna is thinking, I wonder if Luca met John Lynn on Craigslist too. Yeah. So she's growing, scrolling through the dating site of Craigslist. I've been there before, and it's a shit show. Never had to do that. <laughs> So Deanna is looking at every single male for male hookup posting on Craigslist in Montreal, which I'm sure is a lot. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that Luca does that, frankly, I find annoying, but in a lot of his posts, he will say a word, then do a space after the word, then a comma, and then another space between the comma and the second word. So oh, that space, would... comma, space. Seeing that would drive me nuts because I've taken... taken typing etiquette yes and like i told you before in all of those comments you know all over the social media posts and stuff all of them are very similar he like so hot sexy boy little prince right he also always spells probably probably so p-r-o-b-a-l-y yeah. every time I can't even pronounce that, like that spelling. I couldn't pronounce it correctly. <laughs> anyway, you know, everyone has that one word they can't spell for the life of them. Mine is definitely, I cannot spell that word. <laughs> Thank the gods for autocorrect on that one. Mm, yeah. For the longest time, I just would say deaf in text messages. Sounds about right. <laughs> Deanna knew all of these things along with other things. So she knew exactly how to find anything Luca typed. Okay. Like, I'm sure you could probably identify me posting something because of my issues with grammar and spelling. Yes. For sure. I text you without editing it, editing it and making sure everything is correct. Same with Amanda. We both do because we are comfortable with each other, I guess. Like, yeah. And also, I, I can like, definitely you, tell yeah. whether it's you typing or somebody else typing. Yeah, for sure. So then she finds a post from May 24th, 2012. 9.39 a.m., one day before the murder occurred. Mm -hmm. Space, comma, space. She sees it in the title. Yeah, that shit would drive me freaking nuts. <laughs> it said, I'm looking for a sexy guy. I'm not going to be sucking cock. Send me pictures of your face. Send me your body. I'm making a movie for me. It's for fun. Dot, dot, dot. Yes. Yeah. Deanna then started thinking more thoroughly about the song being played in the video of the murder. She remembers that Luca leaves breadcrumbs in all of his videos, referencing okay. pop culture, movies, and different things. Deanna remembers the song is in the opening credits, credits of the movie American Psycho. Right. Patrick Bateman, played by Christian Bale in American Psycho, is a very vain man, which Luca has in common with him. She believes he starts to identify with this character. But Patrick Bateman is also this insane serial killers. Serial killers don't just kill once. They want to kill again. Yeah. Also, the phrase that was written in the closet is a direct quote from that movie. That's it. I <laughs> knew I'd recognized it. So just a little added here. The toxicology report of Jun Lin of his torso, because they still haven't found his full body yet at this point. Right. Um, they found oxazepam Oxi oxapam oxapam okay. in it, which is a sedative yes um the wine bottle that they found in the trash also mm -hmm. contained the same sedative so they've pretty much figured out all the trash that, it, that luke had brought down and p 
piece together a crime scene. Right. Um, on June 5th, 2012, a package containing a right foot was delivered to St. George's School. No, no. And another, and another package containing a right hand to False Creek Elementary School. That's not... In Vancouver. Like, and, you know, if you're going to taunt people, that's one thing. But goddamn, don't, like, fuck with kids. Yeah. Jesus. And it was confirmed that both packages were sent from Montreal. Okay. Um, on June 13th, 2012, the four limbs and the torso were matched to Jun Lin using DNA samples from his family. Wow. And on July 1st, his head was recovered at the edge of a small lake in Montreal's Angrignon Park. You got me. <laughs> After police received an anonymous tip, probably Luca. Yeah. So Luca's mom talked about her a little bit briefly here and there. Mm -hmm. She's watching TV and she's heard all about the murder on the news. It's all over. And suddenly the police are releasing a suspect. Yeah. Luca Rocco Magnana, along with a picture. Her oh, son. All I over. bet that's got to be real rough. Yeah. To see your own child's face on the freaking news and for murder. So <sighs> now at this point, the Montreal police decide to join the Facebook group. Because they finally believe they have some credibility to them. Fucking took long enough. <laughs> Keep in mind, if they had talked to them three months prior, John Lynn could be alive today. Yes. The group turned over all of their evidence to the police. So John starts coming up with some brainstormed ideas. And they talk about Casablanca and the opening scene. It's a picture of the globe. And then it zooms in on France. Mm -hmm. The ending scene. The famous quote... Will always have Paris. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like a foreshadowing for yeah. Hey, I'm headed to Paris. You know, well, the Casablanca poster was in the video of the murder. That's true. You know, Bread comes and the and it was in the trash. Yes. Mm hmm. Hmm. I mean, I got to give him props. He's he's leaving breadcrumbs, but he's making them chase for it. <laughs> yeah. So an arrest warrant for Luca was issued by the Service de Police de la Villa de Montreal. Okay. Um, and it was later upgraded to a Canada-wide warrant by the Royal Canadian Mounted, Canadian Mounted Police. Okay. Accusing him of the following crimes. First-degree murder. Committing an indignity to a dead body. Yeah. Publishing obscene material. Okay. Mailing obscene, indecent, immoral, or scurrilous scur material. And um, criminally harassing Canadian Prime Minister, Minister Stephen Harper and several unnamed members of Parliament. Okay. That's a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> On May 31st, 2012, Interpol issued a red notice for Luca at the request of Canadian authorities. Okay. Oh. Good. Yeah, good, good, and good. for several days before and after his arrest, his name and photo were displayed prominently at the top of the home page of the Interpol website. Wow. The red notice requested that Magnata be pre provisionally arrested pending extradition back to Canada by Interpol, by mm -hmm. any Interpol member state. Good deal. Yeah. Prior to the red notice, Magnata booked a round trip ticket for a flight from Montreal to Paris on May 25th. Using a passport with his own name. Moron. <laughs> After his arrival in France, the police found CCTV footage of him in Paris and his debit card hit an ATM and they looked around at every hotel in Paris, but to no avail. Okay. But the next day he is on the news that he's in Paris. It was leaked to the press oh. and calls are coming in of sightings of him all over Paris. Literally the entire map of Paris. Yeah. <laughs> good Lord. But Luca has a history of being good at avoiding being caught. He wrote yeah. a blog about it before. Oh, and he, he did? Yes, actually. And he's good at disguising himself. Um, actually, in, he actually has a bald head, and in those videos, he's wearing a wig. Oh, wow. Yes. Well, it's not like bald. It's like crew cut more. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's short, really short. Um. And all this news coverage, his face is plastered on every TV screen. He's not going to stay in Paris for long. Hell no. Um, 
So they finally I mean, not if he's smart. Yeah. So they finally find the hotel he was in and his cell phone because his cell phone signal was traced to a hotel in Bagnolet. Okay. But he had left by the time police arrived. Uh, of course he did. Um, pornographic magazines and an air sickness bag were found in the hotel room. That's random. Yeah. Luca used a false passport with the name Kirk Trammell at the hotel. Okay. So Luca boarded a Eurolines bus at the Bang- Bagnolet Coat Station bound for Berlin, Germany. Mm. Um, it's seen on CCTV. On June 4th, 2012, he was apprehended by Berlin police at an internet cafe in the Nukelin district while reading news articles, stories about himself. Narcissistic much? Yeah, the um, internet cafe worker, the person running the, the... Like barista, yeah. basically? Yes, he identified him because his face is plast- all, uh, plastered everywhere. Yeah. All over the world. So, um, he tried giving fake names before admitting who he was, and his identity identity was confirmed through fingerprint evidence. Oh. Luca appeared in a Berlin court on June 5th, 2012. According to German officials, he did not oppose his extradition. There was sufficient, sufficient evidence to keep him in custody until extradition, and he agreed to the simplified process. Wow. And on June 18th, 2012, Magnato was delivered to Canada, Canadian authorities in Berlin and flown abro- aboard a Royal Canadian Air Force CC-150 Polaris. Okay. It's a type of plane. Okay. To the Mirabel International Airport north of J- Montreal. Okay. A military transport was reported by the government to be necessary due to safety concerns with using a commercial flight and potential legal difficulties if the plane was diverted to another country. Right. And he was placed into solitary, solitary confinement at the Riviere de, S- de Prairies detention center. Luca elected to be tried by a judge and jury. Okay. Um, he pleaded not guilty. Of course he did. Admitting to the acts of which he was accused, but claiming diminished capacity due to mental disorders. Didn't seem very diminished on all that fucking wild goose chase. Yeah. Crown attorney Louis Bouffier made his opening statement on September 29th, 2014. Quebec Superior Court Justice Guy Cordier presided over the trial, which lasted 10 weeks. Damn. Yeah. Six tools, a pair of scissors, two knives, a screwdriver, an oscillating saw, and a hammer were recovered outside of Luca's apartment and analyzed by ballistics expert Gilbert Desjardins. Okay. He said none could definitively be linked to the killing and that no skeletal marks suggested the screwdriver or scissors were used, but some con- were consistent with saw and knife or exacto blade injuries. Hmm. If anybody's curious of why a ballistics expert would be involved in that, is because tracing ballistics is kind of the same thing for knife marks and saw marks, because you're looking at how it cuts, how it's marked. That's Just figure out, throw that out there. During the trial, defense attorney Luc LeClaire argued that Luca was in a psychotic state at the time of the crimes and could not be held responsible for his actions. Uh huh. The Crown prosecutor argued that the murder of Jun Lin was organized and premeditated and that Luca was purposeful, mindful, ultra organized, and ultimately responsible for his actions. Okay, yeah, I'm yes. I'm on that side of it. Luca told a psychiatrist who interviewed him about the night he killed Jun Lin that a person named Manny, who he said was an abusive client from his escort service, was there urging him to kill. Hmm. This is also the story he told his mother, mother which she still believes to this day. Gotcha. Um, basically, the story he told his mom was is that while he was in the escort business, he got involved with this guy named Manny who just slowly over time became more and more controlling, like a pimp, 
yeah. esque wise and that eventually it escalated to them making these snuff films for large amounts of money. But if you were doing that, why did you post it to YouTube where it's free? Yeah. Is where it doesn't add up to me. Right. Um, well, kind but of... a note to add to this defense side before you put your thing in. In the video of the snake eating the kitten, mm -hmm. there does appear to be a second set of hands stroking the snake's belly the same time as Luca's hands at the end of the video. Hmm. Well, I was going to say that uh, you typically want to believe your children, no matter what the case. But if there's an extra set of hands, I don't know. That kind of throws a yes. wrench in the deal. Luca also contacted and met with an attorney, Romeo Salta, before the murder happened and gave the same story to him and trying to find some legal precedent on a way to get out. Hmm. And this attorney believed his story. Okay. So there's that. It was, but it was then determined after he gave this um, story. Yeah. That the name Tremel alias was inspired by Sharon Stone's fictional character, Catherine Chamel, Tremel, and fiance Manny Vasquez. Both from the film Basic Instinct. Ah. Yeah, that kind of throws a monkey wrench the other direction. Yeah. <clears throat> Prosecutor, prosecutors also suggested that the black screwdriver used by Magnata to stab John Lynn mm -hmm. had been painted silver to resemble the ice pick used in Basic Instinct's murder scene. Wow. Yes. So Luca chose not to testify during the trial. Smart. -ish. Probably. And after a 12-week trial, which included 10 weeks of hearing testimony, mm -hmm. the jury of eight women and four men received final instructions from the trial judge on December 15th, 2014, and was sequestered before beginning the deliberations the next day. Okay. On their eighth day of deliberation... They returned a verdict of guilty on all charges. Damn, it took eight days? Yes. Wow. They must have had some really compelling evidence on both sides. Right? Luca will serve a mandatory life sentence and will be eligible per for parole after 25 years. But he was also sentenced to 19 years for other charges to be served concurrently. Oh, that's good. Um, Luca filed an appeal for the convictions to be annulled and a new trial ordered. The appeal was filed with the Quebec Court of Appeals by his defense counsel, Luke Leclerc, mm -hmm. citing judicial error and in jury instruction. The appeal further claimed that the verdicts are unreasonable and unsupported by the evidence and the instructions. But Luca withdrew his appeal on February 18th, 2015. So, um, if he was sentenced in 2014 to 25 plus 9, 39, 2014 plus 19 years, mm -hmm. 2058. Okay. Yeah. Is when he would get out. See, but you know, they always get less than those sentences. Or I think he has a man. He has mandatory. He's eligible man after twenty five years. Right. So he's got yeah. a mandatory nineteen, eligible for parole at twenty five. Yeah. So yeah. So he'll be in there for a hot minute either way. Yeah. And depending on his age, if he gets paroled, he'll be damn near middle aged. I think this kind of does have a possibility for an open discussion about mental health though and like where i mean he does have a diagnosis of schizophrenia yeah so and i know that the movie thing kind of makes it seem even more calculated but i mean people with schizophrenia have issues with 
separating fiction from reality. And I'm not trying to come to his defense about anything that he did, but I do think that there is an issue where we have people who are criminally insane who are in the prison system and with no chance of rehabilitation mm -hmm. because they're not getting the what they need to be re rehabilitated. Right. I'll, I'll give you that. Um, now, I will say, though, like, as far as the schizophrenia goes, from what knowledge I do have of it, there's kind of like a it's a double sided coin, you know, uh, you know, two two sides of the same coin, because you've got the one extreme of they're super calculated. Everything is calculated because of being paranoid. The other side is they're so paranoid that everything is out to get them, which he seems to have shown signs of both. So I don't know. Cause yeah, but he also really wanted like this notoriety for being well, a yeah. too at the same time. I don't know. There's well, kind of a whole. It seems like he tried to become famous like the normal way. Yeah. There. And then things kind of just went askew. Well, and there is an interview with his mom about like him being bullied for being like of petite figure mm -hmm. for being a boy and um being a little bit more being bullied for being a little bit more feminine yeah well um before, his mom says he's bisexual and not fully homosexual but well, i was gonna say before the lgbtqia plus community which is a bit of qua. Sure. <laughs> the, I was going to say what I, what I normally call it, but I don't want to get yelled at. But anyway, uh, like, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Back in 2012, things weren't as... Accepting. As yeah. they are now. And you really, like, even now, things aren't that accepting, <laughs> no. depending on where you are. But, no, like, where, where you had made the comment that, you know, his mom said that, you know, he was called certain names derogatory terms for more feminist attraction of his of his personality Just his body type he was kind of a scrawny guy right yeah. well like okay us growing up like that was a thing man like you you didn't want to be too scrawny you didn't want to be can't be too, too fat, clean can't be too thin can't be too yeah. clean can't be too dirty yeah because but, yeah. then you would get called any number of derogatory terms but um what I was going to say about the schizophrenia thing, though, was like you talked about how he reported in his Facebook posts and all that stuff that like, oh, the paparazzi are after me. Oh, I'm I'm uh, associated with Carla Homolka. Right. Which seems like a scenario just made well, up in his mind. Yeah. Not only does it seem made up, it also has that paranoid. I'm being followed. I'm being followed. I'm being followed. They're out to get me. They're out to get me. Yeah. That's, that's so what do you think do you think he really was fucking nuts um do you think he got he his was, just desserts what do you what do you think so on on the murder side of it like the actual murder side of it and the wanting to be thing yeah yeah and wanting to be a serial killer aspect of it yeah i believe that was 100 percent him the cat thing though I can see that being um, kind of like pushed on him because there is a true snuff film desire out there. It's very gross. But from coming across it on accident, not all of snuff films are the people getting snuffed out. Right. And I'm like, Ah, well, I don't know how I came across this, but why? <laughs> yeah, I don't it's know. Okay, we've all been there, babe. I've had some weird shit show up. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Or like links on Facebook, and all of a sudden you're watching some chick suck a donkey dick, and they're like, "How the fuck do we get here?" You know, I don't know. On this one, I, I'm kind of a uh, kind of on on both sides of it. Like, yeah, dude's got mental problems. Was he fully responsible for his actions? 
maybe not a 100% responsible. It seems like there's some premeditation in there with the mm -hmm. Craigslist post and stuff. The Craigslist post, the catch me if you can situation. The little breadcrumbs. The and, breadcrumbs. Yeah. yeah, he definitely knew enough about what he was doing to be considered guilty for his actions. But was he a hundred percent responsible for everything? I don't know. Kind of kind of up in the air. Yeah. So I don't know. I feel like you could be having a psychotic break and still not want to be caught for murder. Well, I don't think anybody wants to get caught yeah. when they do something wrong. And but, still premeditate something, but still be like, I don't know. It's just the justice system just it's it needs to be revisited. I think I'm not saying that he doesn't deserve to be to be left to rot in prison, but he also deserves to have quality of life in regards to mental health care. Well, that's how I feel about it. Canada, which his trial was in Canada. Yeah, he's incarcerated in Canada. They have a hell of a lot better prison system than we do. So he's probably getting mental health care. That's good. In Canada. Because ours, I'll tell you how it goes. Lock you up and throw away the key. Well, no, it's not It's not quite that bad. So at least in the state of Indiana, where, where I worked for a state prison for a short bit there, um, they shut down our mental health facilities that were considered criminally insane mm -hmm. because they had done a criminal act but needed mental health. They shut that down and then they just threw them back into the prison system. Well, depending on what type of mental health problem they had, they were either GP or they were program. GP being general, general pop population. Yeah. Um, and I hate to say this, but the ones that have the manic episodes um, or have some form of autism are gen pop. And they are hard to deal with. Very difficult to deal with because their triggers could be any number of things and they are not in the best places for that. Basically what you're trying to say is you are not the staff in these situations are not fully equipped to handle people oh, with hell these no. needs. Oh, hell no. And then the reverse, I have also dealt with people with intellectual disabilities who have severe mental health issues where we are just not equipped to deal with right. the mental manipulation. We're, we're pretty equipped to deal with getting our ass beat because somebody is overstimulated. It's when they're being manipulative and actually trying to cause yeah. you harm. That is just the mental health side of what I do that we're not fully there. Yeah. It's just a hot mess. Yeah. So. Yep, pretty much. I, I mean, not that my agency is a hot mess or... There is something that's coming into effect in New York State, or at least they're talking about, like, def actually defining our job. Okay. And it being something that's actually defined in the healthcare field. Because when you say direct support professional, most people don't know what that means. And then there are a lot of people who have, that do the same thing I do and have different titles. And so... There is so much need for what I do that it should have the same kind of recognition as everybody knows what a CNA is. Yeah, or LPN, RN, yeah. you know, all the ends. And I do all of those things. Heck, I do tube feeds, like, you know, right. so. And, yeah, no, and you pass meds, which is typically an RN position. LPN. LPN position, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I feel like we're, it may be just now happening, but I feel like we're moving towards the right direction. In, yeah. In I feel like there minus. needs to be prison reform, a lot of prison reform before we could be there, and publicly, public prison instead of private prison. Right. Needs to happen before mental health is really where it needs to be for-profit prison shouldn't be a right a statement well i mean my only experience working with the prison system is obviously in indiana um but they wound up shutting down like four or five of the private institutes 
simply because they were overcrowding just to get extra money. Yeah. And it was it was investigated. So of course yeah. that overcrowded the state prisons, but you know, nobody wanted to talk about that. <laughs> <sighs> There's a lot of issues with the justice system, not just Yes. The prisons. <laughs> yes, our American justice system hell our American freaking way of looking at everything just needs a reset because the way this country was founded the way it was meant to progress we did something wrong yeah somewhere yeah i mean just the fact that this like roe v wade was being over being overturned is yeah yeah we won't get into that no all right so what do you have um, well, I'm, I'm not going to tell you directly what I've got yet, uh, cause I'm going to get into my random facts and it'll, it'll open you up to what's going on. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the day this episode airs, it'll be September 11th. Mm -hmm. It's been 22 years since the events of the tragic day of two in 2001, but I feel like a moment of silence should be held instead of going into the conspiracy theories and I don't know, like tearing apart people's lives again. Yeah. So I'm going to give a moment of silence and I hope our listeners will respect that. Yeah. Um, also, I think something that's good and healing is maybe we could talk about our experience from 9-11 a little bit okay. in remembrance. Sure. Do you remember what, where you were? I do. I remember exactly where I was. And sadly, 9-11 is not, the Twin Towers is not what I remember about it. Um, I was, I had just gotten home from school because we got sent home early. Uh, nobody explained really what was going on. We just, our teacher, somebody from our school walked into our fourth grade classroom, whispered to the teacher. Teacher said, all right, everybody collect your things. You need to get, get your backpacks ready, this, that, and the other. We got on our school buses, went home. I went home. I had to use the landline to call my mom at work and let her know I was home. And my dad was working a local job at that point in the oil field. And I got a phone call from my dad telling my mom or to tell my mom that she needed to bring him a change of clothes and um, his medical records to the hospital as soon as she could. No explanation, no nothing. There had been a rig fire that had exploded and it had killed several people and my dad was covered in someone's blood at that point. So they had to take everything from him and hazmat him and all that good stuff. So, yeah, my my recognition of that day was not the Twin Towers. However, after my mom got home, that's when I found out about the Twin Towers in the next several days. I was watching the news over military stuff, not what happened, you know. Okay. How about you? I remember exactly where it was. I can see it in my mind, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember what grade I was in, but it would have been a grade above you, so fifth grade. Most um, I was in, and the school that I went to in the town that I lived in, fifth grade was in middle school mm -hmm. um, at that time. I don't think it is anymore. Right. Anyway, um, I was in class, and my mom showed up at the school to get me. And I was told that my mom was there. And... Oh. My grandfather at the time would have been 91, Damn. 92, something right. like that. So I was, and I, and he had, was not doing well. So I was assuming the worst out of that. And right. so I was already grieving as soon as I knew my mom was there. Cause we were kind of expecting this call. Yeah. You know, um, 
but I don't think he passed until 2002, I think. Okay. So he, it was not my grandpa. <laughs> right. Um, I lived outside of Washington, D.C. in Hagerstown by like 45, 30 minute drive from D.C. Yeah, and excluding traffic. <laughs> and um, my mom came and picked me up because of what happened at the towers and because she assumed that school was going to be let out. <laughs> right and um she just like didn't really explain to me what was going on mm -hmm. she just said that something bad happened and that we were gonna find more about out about it when we got home mm -hmm. and so we got home and we immediately put the news on and my dad came home shortly after us and we watched the second towers get hit in real time ah. <clears throat> then shortly after that we found out about the pentagon and my cousin actually worked for that section of the pentagon but was homesick that day out of pure luck no doubt and um that was obviously the panic that was going on with us at that time was that my cousin was hurt yeah i know that my mom called my uncle to make sure he wasn't on a on a flight that day because at the time my uncle traveled a lot for work and so yeah i understand that and um so yeah, I kind of assumed they let school out for years in my town because we were so close to DC. Mm -hmm. But I guess I'm finding out from more and more people that like everybody went home in the entire country that day. Yeah, because um, from what from what I've understood over years is that um, it was kind of like a, a fear. state of emergency. Yeah, it was a fear that more than just a political area was going to be under attack so they were sending everybody home from school in case schools were attacked next because it was a terrorist event yeah so and i remember like not really fully understanding what was happening i had an idea of death and war and that people killed each other but mm -hmm. It was still really confusing to me and we watched the news for days yeah and um i think it kind of messed me up with news because <laughs> i don't really watch it anymore yeah i i mean we we obviously grew up in different styles of life choices so yeah i was fully aware of how military worked and fully aware of uh what death destruction mayhem was and what a terrorist event was because my parents had been like this is going to be a trivial moment in your life you need to understand which was the space shuttle blowing up timothy mcveigh being executed uh you know major events in our timeline my fucking parents were like just stare at the screen and watch pay attention you need to know and i'm like why do i need to know why? <laughs> but that's neither here nor there so anyway, like I was saying, though, out of out of respect to those who have passed and or got hurt or their loved ones in any manner, I decided n not to go over the conspiracy theories because they were pretty big, but they're pretty indecent to those who Died. have suffered that yeah. day. Um, so I'm going to do something different. Do you know whose birthday is the 10th of September? I do not. My great grandfather. <laughs> My grandmother's birthday was September eighteenth. <clears throat> Ooh. Um, you know who else though? Marie Laveau. Ooh. Mm hmm And since we're going down to New Orleans for our honeymoon, which is only a month and a half away. I know. I thought we should uh you know, start talking a little bit about the interest of New Orleans and stuff like that. So why not talk about the voodoo queen herself? Sounds like a plan. I'm here for it. <laughs> All right. I got I got a few sources for um, where I got all my information, but mostly good old Wikipedia didn't help. <laughs> uh, gave same information but not detailed enough. Um, however, the Ghost Tours of New Orleans, which is a New Orleans touring company, they had a website where I got a lot of the information. And then I did, uh, I looked up a History Channel documentary on voodoo, and then I just used YouTube. 
to research. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, shit, I forgot to add my sources into my story. <laughs> well, what's your sources? My sources were um, Google and Wikipedia and YouTube and Don't Fuck With Cats docuseries on Netflix. Okay. Well, uh, now we got that out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> How about we start with voodoo? I'm not going to go into full detail over voodoo. Okay. Because it's got a very long, dark, dirty history. But. Isn't it like a cross between like Africa and slavery and like Louisiana and French? Like, well. Um, All of those influences kind of combined. How about I? How about I read through this? Because I, I get into I, I do tap into some of those. Okay? okay. All right. So, voodoo itself, like I said, has a very long and pretty damn bloody history. Um, it was. It's mostly entangled with the need to survive by the people that were involved in the slave trade. Unfortunately, coming from West Africa. Many sources refer back to the uh, Fawn, which is, it's spelled Fang, F-A-N-G, but it's pronounced Fawn, tribe of West Africa, being put, the entirety of them being put into the slave trade and shipped to Haiti. The Fawn pronounced their religious belief as Vodou, uh, spelled V-O-D-O-U, instead of V-O-O-D-O-O. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now bringing their religious beliefs to Haiti with them, the entire area grew to become basically the voodoo capital of the Caribbean. Whereas like we see New Orleans being the voodoo capital of the U S or some people are ignorant and think it's the voodoo capital of the world. It's definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that with all that, there is some debate if Marie Laveau made voodoo popular in the U S or if she just made it slightly more acceptable by the Catholics and by disguising voodoo as deities, as Catholic saints. If you think about it, a lot of like the Catholic saints or patrons or whatever are the same ideology of voodoo. Like those persons and statuettes and stuff like that are the same deities. Okay. Okay. Now, since we're since we're supposed to be discussing Marie Lo, let's uh, let's get into her history. Um, in my fact of the day, I said that her birthday is actually the tenth of September. Unfortunately, that's just a best guess because during her time of birth, she was um, come from a, an enslaved family and stuff like that, and they don't have birth records. But based on when people celebrated and people you know, did judgment calls on how old she was when she died, approximate and stuff like that. Best guess is September 10th. Okay. Okay. Like I said, her, her birth is not recorded. However, her baptism was. And all the celebrations and even her death is all thoroughly recorded. So we have an idea. That's where they made these calculations. Okay. But what is known about her birth is that she was born in what is today's French Quarter to Marguerite Darkentrell. I forgive me, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> she was a freed slave and mistress to Charles Laveau, spelled slightly different than Marie Laveau. I don't understand why, but it is. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, Charles was a wealthy white businessman which just mind blowing at the time because of her mom wanting to spend time with Charles and they, it's kind of like a not an okay thing yeah. to, you know, at the time. Uh, it was very much not an okay thing. So can't decode it. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm just, you know, trying to be respectful and spit facts at the same time. So yes. it's, it's a little hard because of the situation Marie was left with her grandmother, Miss Catherine, and her mother left, went back to 
spend time with Charles and pretty much was not involved in her life ever again. That's shitty. Yeah. She got the full name Marie Catherine Laveau <laughs> because of Miss Catherine. And she was the first born free black woman in her family. Wow. Mm-hmm. Not, mo- not much is known about her younger years, you know, the teens and less, because there's really nothing recorded about other than specific birthday event, like major events in the town that included everybody. Okay. But nothing specifically says, hey, Marie Laveau was here doing this at this time. But the next stop in her history story here is the 4th of August, 1819. She marries a free Haitian man named Jacques Paris. How I was told to pronounce it. <laughs> okay. Um, she got a wedding gift from her dad, of all people, Mr. Charles over here. Uh, Charles Laveau gave her a whole property. Wow. Literally just gave her some land and a house. Um, it was a, a full plot of land on Love Street, which is now Rampart Street. Um, I I guess they, Marie and her husband didn't really want it because records show by 1822, Paris and Laveau had gotten rid of it and bought a place on Dauphine Street. Dauphine? Dauphine. Dauphine Dauphine Street. Thank you. Um, Now, most researchers say that they didn't have any children, but baptism records show from St. Louis Cathedral that Marie and, and uh, Paris had two daughters, Marie Angelie Paris and Felicite, F E L I C I T E, Paris, Paris. Okay. Now, doing some math, Felicite, Felicite. Oh, yeah, I something. Know. I don't know. I'm just going to call her um, FP <laughs> to help myself because she's not mentioned a whole lot after this. Okay. All right. Uh, doing some math, people have found that FP would have been born two years before Laveau and Patty married. Okay. Which was unheard of. Well, yeah. On, on either side of the fence there, on the African background, stuff like that, you did not have children out of your respective it's not necessarily a wedding in Africa. It's like a joining, whatever. And then on, you know, the Catholic side of it, hell no. <laughs> you don't have kids out of wedlock. It's a sin. Yes. Anyway, records of these two girls stop here. Like, right there. Baptism, done. Nothing really else is said about them. But oddly enough, just how the records of those two daughters just stop, so does the record of her husband. There's no death, no death record anywhere. Hmm. There's no tax res, or no tax record, no property record, no nothing after this point. Wow. Yeah. But Marie starts calling herself the Widow Paris or Paris. Fret not, for the Voodoo Queen does find love again. Okay. Mm-hmm. At some point in 1826, she meets Luis. Christophe de Menzel, de Glapion. Okay, a lot of names. It's a, it's a lot of names. And I just refer to him as Glapion from here on out. Or Glapion, Glapion, I don't know. Anyway. Why not just Louis or Louise? Sure, I'll call him Louise. That'll make it easy. <laughs> uh, now, Louise is, a pro- uh, is from a prominent New Orleans family. Um, he's very wealthy. And he's white. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Surprisingly, from records, interracial couples, not marriages, but couples, were extremely common in New Orleans. Hmm. But Louisiana still had a law that different races could not marry. So, what do they do? Just spend 30 years of their life together in happily common law marriage. Nice. Mm -hmm. Now, when Marie's grandmother passed away in 1831, uh, you know, asshole creditors 
decided to take advantage of the situation and, and try to take everything, including her cottage. This happens to be the same cottage that Marie was basically born and raised in. Wow. Yeah. So obviously it's very close to Marie's heart. Mm -hmm. Out of true passionate love for Marie, Luis paid for it outright. He stepped up and bought the entire property. Wow. Paid everything outright so she could have that place. Aww. Marie and her husband and their family moved into that cottage and lived there until the end of the 19th century, late 1800s. Wow. Now, sadly, Luis died in 1855. But after 30 years with him, records seem to show that Marie never took up another man in her life. I mean, who could, who could out, outdo a love like that, you know? Right. Okay, so what makes her a voodoo queen? Well, I'm getting there. Because <laughs> it, it's actually just a couple bullet points away. <laughs> <laughs> Rumor has it, though, that that Marie and Louise or Louis were actually a pretty uh, pretty busy couple, if you know what I mean. Oh, fifteen kids in twenty Holy years. Holy shit! <laughs> However, public record shows only seven between eighteen twenty seven and eighteen thirty nine. That's still a lot of fucking kids. Three of which passed away at infancy. Aww. Mm -hmm. Marie Glapion was born in 1836, who turns out to live the longest. But we'll get more about her in just a little bit. Okay. Okay. Now, as you questioned, what makes Marie Laveau the voodoo queen? Yeah. You know, she's she's portrayed as in our minds as this very stern, strict voodoo woman, like you don't fuck with people because Marie Laveau will get you, right? Right. Well, I think you're in for a bit of a surprise. Though... No one is actually sure what Marie actually did during her spare time. It's believed by many, many, many researchers that Marie, who began began calling herself the widow Par uh, Paris, probably spent majority of her time in the servitude of others. And not in a bad way. Because it turns out she was a very generous and devout Catholic woman. Okay. She would use her quote-unquote magic... To help those in need. It, it's strongly believed that her uh, her beliefs in, uh, in Catholicism, she would fill her home with images and relics of the saints to create a safe space for anyone who needed space. Needed her home to get away from whatever. Wow. She would even visit prisoners to minister and offer them guidance to redemption. Having a pretty obvious dislike for Marie Laveau and most likely, like m many even today, a believer that voodoo is evil. Okay? Right. Well, turns out this guy, John Kendall, an early 1900s self-professed expert on Marie Laveau, writes, quote, After dark, you might see carriages roll up to Marie's door and veiled ladies of elegant, attired descend and hurry in to buy what that old witch had for sale an errant fraud no doubt but money poured into her lap down to the last day of her evil life okay so views on voodoo you know honestly though the real negativity towards voodoo is just a whitewashed fear of something not understood by christians that's really what it boils down to. Right. Because my research, even I was like, oh shit, I was way off. And right. I apologize for my <laughs> misunderstandings. Well, I mean, I think the common misconception is the voodoo dolls and the sacrificing of animals and people and mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Which, if you... I don't want to say History Channel did a great, great portrayal of it, but if you do your own research on, into the history of voodoo... It's surprising to find out that, like, the ritual of of sacrificing an animal isn't what we think. We think, like, witches brew, you know, cut an animal and be done. Serve it to Satan and be done, right? That's, that's the Hollywood portrayal we have in our minds. Right. Turns out, no. They would 
sacrifice the blood of these animals to their deities in hopes of good health, good luck, good good feast, good, you know, whatever, right. you know, to provide a better life for themselves. Then they'd eat the damn thing. They wouldn't just waste it. They wouldn't just, like, kill it and be gone. Yeah, they'd use every part of it. Yeah, they would They would literally feast on that with the praise of their their gods and goddesses and deities. Right. I mean, that's pretty common in pretty much all old religions, even mm. Christianity, to sacrifice. Yeah. So. Um, you're ready for a quick surprise, though? Some have given Marie Laveau the nickname Mother Teresa of New Orleans. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because her voodoo, tag, her voodoo queen tag may honestly come from the these gatherings in what's called the Conga Square that Marie would attend and more often than not lead. Okay. The Conga Square is actually a very short walk over Rampart Street from Marie's Cottage. All right, which is on St. Anne Street. Okay. And since we're going there, we'll be able to figure this part out. <laughs> <laughs> In the 1800s, Sundays and holidays were granted by law to the slaves of New Orleans. Kind of just allowing them days off throughout the year. Um, but surprisingly, these people didn't just leisure away their days. No, they would spend these days, quote unquote, off. Gardening, fishing, gathering goods, and selling them or trading them after having went to church. They always went to church of some sort on Sundays. Okay. Okay. The Conga Square was used as an open market at times. Actually, by the mid-1800s, it became a gathering location for all sorts of events for the voodoo people. Okay. Mm-hmm. These weekly gathering, gatherings, a tribute to Marie's voodoo queen title and the legends behind it, because she was there every week selling what are called Gree Gree bags, which, um, give me just a second and I'll explain what those are. But she was also there offering her services, you know, helping lead people to better lifestyles and stuff like that. And she would take part in all of the celebrations, voodoo, Catholic, or otherwise. Okay. Matter. She would be part of the community. Two things about this stand out towards the voodoo image that we have in Marine. Those Grigory bags that I described? Uh-huh. In New Orleans only, they are small bags of herbs and other, quote, magical substances, end quote, used to con take control over another person or protect them or offer them good luck. These celebrations are lots of singing and dancing, but legend says that Marie would conjure the great serpent spirit and be filled slash possessed by Aloha, which Aloha is just like a lesser spirit of a deity. I, I don't know. It was kind of hard to just des describe in our whitewashed views. <laughs> I don't know how to really put it as um, like I would think in a, in a um, Christian viewpoint, like you have God, and then you have angels. But according to this, it's like, no, it's the spirit of that deity, God, but not God. I don't know. It was really hard to explain. Okay. So it's just a lesser spirit of a deity. Okay. It's also believed that the biggest celebration of each year were led by Marie herself. The super big ones. Because once every year, there was this huge celebration in the Voodoo community. And it was known by several different names. But this celebration is observance of the summer solstice or Midsummer's Eve. Um, mm hmm this kind of, quote, holiday actually dates back to the Celtic and Druids and European pagan rituals. It entirely involves swimming, soaking in the blessed waters, and hanging out around large bonfires. Definitely sounds like your kind yep, of party. my kind of party. Unfortunately, the whitewashed views of this gathering have 
have us believing it's full of naked people dancing around chanting in unknown languages and is full of orgies and other savage immoral acts quote unquote. i mean that's that sounds fun too I, <laughs> i'm not gonna complain i'll tell you that anyway <laughs> um in fact that that little quote there at the end the savage and immoral acts um, a local paper from July 1869 describes the Midsummer's Eve as, quote, June is the time devoted by the voodoo worsh- worshippers to the celebration of their most sacred and therefore must, most revolting rites, end quote. Okay. Yeah. That being said, this event still takes place on the Bay- on Bayou Street. Bayou Street. And is open and welcome to everyone not just people of the voodoo community because as the words of the ghost tours thing as long as you're respectful and want to learn you're more than welcome to show up we'll even feed you (laughs) (laughs) i was kind of kind of lost on that one i was like wait really (laughs) (laughs) but it's cool to find out that they're very open to you know, they're, they're not just a closed off community. Like, you don't believe this, you can't do this. So. Right. That is cool. Mm-hmm. Now, let's uh, let's talk about Marie's daughter, Marie the Second. Which one? That's a good point. Because <laughs> it's a little confusing. Because you said two. I know, which is kind of confusing. But there's absolutely no record of the first two daughters. Other than their baptisms? Other than their baptism. So okay. I don't know. Marie the Second is what she is referred to in all notes, um, all my sources, is most likely the source of our image that we think about when we think about Marie Laveau. Right? Okay. Because Marie the Second likes to flaunt herself around New Orleans in a lavish gold jewelry and bright turban called a tignon, uh, that wrap around her head. Uh Um, And she was quick, very quick, to tell anyone and everyone, according to Martha Ward, quote, I am not white, not a slave, not black, not French, not Negro, not African American. I am a free Creole woman of New Orleans. That's cool. End quote. Now, since Marie Laveau was also a hairdresser for the rich and powerful white women of New Orleans, It is believed that Marie Laveau, when she started aging, allowed her daughter to take over, to give the uh, the illusion that she was that that voodoo queen, mythical being that that, lives forever. That lives forever. Sacrifices babies to Papa Legba. Yeah, (laughs) that I mean that was what was about her on American Horror Story. Right, and she killed Delphine Lou Laroe. Mm Hmm. (laughs) <laughs> um, on american horror story <laughs> yeah i've got a couple points about american horror story on here too um marie the second would go as far as wearing her mother's clothes and mimicking her uh her mannerisms like she would make herself her mother according to sources the odd thing is obviously marie would have been seen at church and the voodoo celebrations but we all know how the how the rumor mill works, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of kind of like if her daughter really stepped in, how did she conceal her mother if her mother was literally part of everything else? I don't know. Yeah. Marie the Second was considerably more wicked than her mother, though, as many have stated. Uh, and she would use the conversations that she had while working as the hairdresser to create schemes and to make extra money uh, disguising it all as supernatural powers of voodoo, quote unquote. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like I said, there's a problem with this part of Marie Laveau's story because no one is actually sure who Marie the second is. Question is, is she her daughter Marie Paris or her daughter Marie Glapion or is she one of Marie Laveau's granddaughters or better yet could she even be like the art the author carolyn morrow thinks basically just a mistaken identity of people seeing a black woman wearing a turban wearing 
jewelry and thinking it's Marie Laveau. That's kind of fucked up way to view it, but it happens. Right. You know. And her, um, Carolyn Morrow's kind of like commentary behind it is that in the voodoo community, these traits that, that Marie Laveau is attributed with are common. So seeing a woman of any age, of dark complexion, wearing a turban, wearing the gold jewelry, handing out Grigri bags and making quote unquote spell casting, it's pretty easy to confuse somebody. And at least that's what she says. And, you know, of course, the rumor mill not helping the myth or the legend of right. Marie Laveau either. So on the 15th of June, 1881, Marie Laveau herself, the myth and the legend, the voodoo queen, passes away very peacefully in her cottage with her family on St. Anne Street. She was 79 years old, just only a few months shy of being 80 years old. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a feat. It is. Per New Orleans Cemetery historic records, Marie is interred in what has become one of the most famous tombs in New Orleans and possibly the world. Okay. St. Louis number one cemetery, due to vandalism, is now only viewable under guided tours. During some of these tours, you'll be told about a pretty interesting ghostly ritual of marking her tomb with an X, making a request of the voodoo queen spirit. According to many reports, Marie's spirit does indeed roam around her tomb, and even near her now non-existent cottage. Cottage, for some unknown reason, was demolished in 1907. No hmm. records state why, they just flattened it. Which is very disappointing to find out. That is very disappointing to find out. Yeah. I was kind of excited, like, ooh, we might be able to find it. Right. <laughs> However, it is apparently now just a vacant lot with a marker devoted to Marie Laveau. So, we'll be able to see it when we go on our little tours. A vacant lot. Yeah. <sighs> I know. It's unfortunate. Assholes. Yeah. Fucking white people. Mm -hmm. Now, today, nearly a century and a half after her death, Marie Laveau is so iconic that she has influenced hundreds of songs, movies, TV shows, and other forms of media. Honestly, never heard of her before American Horror Story. Really? Really. There's like a whole song, like, as much as your parents love older music, I'm surprised. Because there's a, like 18 songs I can think of off the top of my head that are titled Marie Laveau or The Queen of Voodoo or something of that nature. Nope. Yeah. And then, uh, let's see. Marie Laveau was in, um, she was in Supernatural. Obviously. She was? Yes. They visit Marie Laveau when they go to, down to New Orleans to fight the, um, oh, I can't remember which one it was. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, American Horror Story? <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's she's in more, uh, American Horror Story, like, for a season and a half, I want to say. Like, she's not in the full second season. No. But. It's not the second season. It's it's a different season, like, all together. But, yeah, she's not in the whole thing. Yeah. I, I, I know that it was, like, she was, like, the main basis for one. She and, was in the entire season of Coven. Yep. And basically, the story was, is that Madame Delphine Lularie mm -hmm. had captured, she's a famous real person, whether or not they existed at the same time, likely, but I, I don't know for certain. Um, but um, anyway, she was a slave owner and respectable member of society in Louisiana yeah. and New Orleans. And um, she was from France and um, she liked to torture her slaves and i was gonna say i've got two things to say about that woman she thought that the blood of young people would keep her young and she would paint her face with it and she really enjoyed just truly heinous torture yes um i was gonna say two things about that woman first is if they did overlap in time it wasn't by many years at least i don't believe i think 
Delphine was like late 1800s and Maria's early 1800s. The other thing is brain soup. If you think of that woman's name, you think of brain soup. And I will explain that another day. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, Delphine, she escaped to France is the official story. It, the, the public did try to lynch her, but she escaped to Paris or France. At least that's public record about it is that she escaped Louisiana. Hmm. But the story that American Horror Story says is that um, Marie Laveau, one of her lovers was one of her victims and um she buried her alive with a live forever elixir mm -hmm. in the backyard of her house oh um fun. not not marie laveau's house but delphine's house right. yes and the coven somebody in the coven finds oh yeah the head honcho of the coven is enemies with the voodoo community mm -hmm. and she finds her buried in the backyard and takes her out and you know who yeah. owns her house now Delphine's who? house no nicholas i know it's cage. a museum it's nicholas cage owns it <laughs> i know it's a museum and i'd like to go there mm -hmm. yeah you can't actually go into the residence but you do like stop on the outside and they discuss it and all that good stuff at least what i've heard i mean in american horror story they do like a tour inside the house I but know. maybe it, I don't know. COVID happened, and since then, so who knows? Yeah. Well, it's also changed like hands enough times. Like Nicholas Cage owns it, but doesn't own it because his like whole lawsuits over the ages and all that stuff. I don't know. It's kind of weird. There's a, there's this whole thing about it. But anyway, <laughs> and Marie Laveau, um, she stays eternally young by sacrificing babies to Papa Legba. Mm. Newborn babies. Yes. Yeah. Don't think she's that bad. <laughs> at least not what. But, not. I mean, to be fair, they still painted her as, like, a pillar in the voodoo community. Someone who, but mm -hmm. only protected the voodoo community. And they were kind of against the white people and yeah. the witches. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of want to go over voodoo, like, in general. But I want to wait until after I go to, we go to New Orleans to get Hell yeah. a better intake on I'm it. I'm so excited. Because it was like listening to the history of voodoo on a documentary about Marie Laveau, I was like, whoa, that is some serious history. Because like president of Haiti used freaking voodoo to manipulate the people. And I'm like, holy shit. Wow. Mm -hmm. So but, that was that Yeah, was that was good. Like, I know. It, was, it wasn't as long because I like literally pretty much scripted that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how else to like make really good notes on it. Organize your thoughts. Yeah. You make fun of me for scripting. I do. And that's why I have a hard time with the fact that I had literally just scripted my thing. Because <laughs> it doesn't leave any room for open conversation if you script it. That's true. I try to pause, but I get lost in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, we have conversation after. Yeah. And you know what? I have kind of an idea from something we should do as maybe um, an extra side quest, quote unquote, for people who are interested in our podcast. Maybe we should have open discussions about things that we're really interested in, not just tell the tale, like have open discussions. Okay. That'd be something we could do on a, I don't know, random Friday night. Just okay. record ourselves bullshitting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, babe, what's the word of the day? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How about you read it this week? Why? Is it a hard word? Yep. Yeah, of course. The word is for Monday, September 11th, 2023. Expropriate. Definition one, to deprive of possession or proprietary rights. Definition two is to transfer the property of another to one's own possession. Quote, the city council rejected a proposal to export, uh, expro expropriate <laughs> private property from the, the highway expansion. Okay. <laughs> now, <clears throat> did you know, if you guessed that that word has something in common with the 
verb appropriate. <laughs> you're right. Both words ultimately derive from the Latin adjective proprius, meaning own. Expropriate came to the English by way of the medieval Latin verb. It's spelled the exact same. Expropriate <laughs> itself from uh, Latin ex, out of or from, and proprius, which is the base word mm -hmm. meaning meaning own. So ex own. <laughs> um, appropriate descends from the Latin appropriare, which joins proprius and the Latin ad or to or toward. Both the verb appropriate, take possession of, or to set aside for a particular use, and the adjective appropriate, they're spelt the same. <laughs> Fitting or suitable. The, having The been, English language. Yeah, having been used with us since the 15th century. And ex expropriate was officially appropriated, oh my god, in the 17th century. Other proprious descendants in the English language include proper and property. Okay. I'm going to slap whoever writes these did you knows. Because <laughs> it's they're spelled the same six different times in the same damn sentence. <laughs> oh, my God. I know. You got me lost. <laughs> uh, that's frustrating. Well, hey, you learned a new word, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I may have just lost you as much as I lost myself and, and me? Cassie over here. <laughs> ah. So tell them where they can find us. Oh, no, no. I just did word of the day. You get to tell them <laughs> where they find um, us. Um, On all social media platforms and all podcasting streaming services, we are under this and that with me and you. Mm -hmm. um, we are not on Twitter. Nope, and, not on Twitter. And then you can email us with suggestions or comments or feedback on or your own personal stories we yeah. love those at t-a-t-w-m-a-y one at gmail.com tat w may one at gmail.com yeah mm -hmm. so um like subscribe comment share you know do all those social media things mm -hmm. <laughs> have a good night have a good day have, have a, a day have a day <laughs> bye bye